the big news of the day is that reports are all over the media that rockets are flying into Israel from Lebanon. We've been seeing this. Uh, you turn on any of the mainstream news and you're just going to see uh, Israel under attack, rockets flying in from Lebanon. Um, they then, you know, people are starting to think, oh, my gosh, it's a war between Israel and Lebanon. And then they change it to, well, it's militia groups and it's, of course, Iranian-backed militias or Hamas-backed or um, same narrative. We've heard this definitely before. But what is really going on there? You turn on certain news, you're going to hear one side of the story. And it's important to get the other side of the story when it comes to this. There is a reason why there's current tension happening, and we are going to dive into that. Um, we do have joining with us a Peabody award-winning journalist and also producer for Arab Talk Radio, uh, Jamal Dajani. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So let's first start off with the rockets. They're saying that I think at the, it, it, over several dozen rockets have fl flown into Israel from Lebanon. Um, who is firing off these rockets? Well, it is unconfirmed uh, who's firing those rockets. Uh, some reports say it is uh, uh, elements of Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Others said it's uh, maybe could be uh, Lebanese factions, but you don't have any anyone who really have confirmed who is behind this. But this is really not the big story of the day. This is this is uh, in, in a, as a matter of fact, it is a big distraction. Uh, you know, it, considering what what has been going on for the past several days, incursions into Al Aqsa Mosque, attack on uh, Palestinians in during the holy month of Ramadan. And the, the new right-wing Israeli government, Ben Gavir and Smotrich and, and many other things. So it might be a reaction to frustration, but uh, we don't know. I, I, think, I think the focus should not be on this because this happened before. It happened uh, also uh, for in Gaza. And usually there is an action for every action. There is a reaction. And this is one of them. Let's talk about the raid on Al-Aqsa Mosque and what's going on there. So if you could explain, um, it, it's Ramadan right now and worshipers are going to the mosque. Um, and then, you know, what, what's been going on with these raids? Well, during Ramadan, uh, Muslims, uh, I mean, of course, they go through the whole ritual of fasting, prayers and so forth. And they have a very important prayer in the evening uh, called Salat al-Taraweeh, which is the evening prayer. And also people go and spend a lot of time at a mosque. And of course, in Jerusalem, the holiest mosque is Al-Aqsa. And, and, and uh, you know, they meditate, they pray, and uh, thousands and thousands of them descend uh, onto Jerusalem. And Israel, for many years, they have been putting all kinds of restrictions, uh, preventing men under the age of 40 from entering Jerusalem. Many of them have to climb over Israel's apartheid wall or get smuggled in to get into there. And and we saw, I mean, you know, the picture, pictures speak a thousand words. Uh, uh, those were unarmed civilians who were in the midst of their prayers. And the Israeli media and its surrogates, they tried to present it as uh, they were uh, hiding in Al-Aqsa. And that's, that's really a blatant lie because every single year, Palestinians um, you go to Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is something very well known. And the Israeli soldiers, they go in with full gear, desecrated with their boots, carrying guns, stun, uh, you know, lobbing stun grenades and rubber bullets. And, and we've seen the result. Uh, and, and, and there is no excuse for this. It's a violation of international law. It has been condemned by several countries. Uh, of course, the United States says they usually condemn Palestinians when something, uh, you know, when violence happens. But, but then the statement that comes out from the United States is that they are concerned. Now, uh, you've seen thousands and thousands of Israelis demonstrating in Tel Aviv against this right-wing extremist fascist government. But you haven't seen Israeli soldiers beating up the Israeli demonstrators. But then when they come to Palestinian territories, they have the green light to not only attack them viciously, but in certain instance, instances kill them. 
And that was what's, what was happening uh, fairly recently in the West Bank, from what I understand, is that there was a lot of, uh, there was uh, people, many Palestinians have been killed. I, this year alone, has it been 90? Over, over 90? Over yeah, 90? And, 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 and several hundred injured. And, you know, last year we've had the murder of journalist Shirin Abu Akhli, a Palestinian-American. And not only she was murdered, but her funeral was attacked. Uh, Israel, I saw today in, in the media, for example, when we talk about these rockets, that one of those rockets landed close to a children's playground. And so the media covered that, but they forgot to mention that in 2014, Israeli rockets killed four kids playing at the beach in Gaza. So we see the double standard in the coverage, and you can see the frustration you know, for Palestinians and Palestinian Americans. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely one-sided coverage. Um, and really just the painting of an entire group of people as terrorists. And that seems to always be the excuse. It's, well, this is safety and security issue. Uh, we have to stop the terrorists that are that are going to be that are going to be coming after us. And so we have to storm the mosques. We have to uh, beat the people. We have to do all these checkpoints. And um, and it, it's really, really, I, I've been to the West Bank myself, I've been to Jerusalem, I've been to Al-Aqsa Mosque, I've seen this with my own eyes, what actually is happening there. And it is very much a one-sided narrative here in the United States, very much a one-sided narrative. And when you go there and you see it for yourself, you can feel the tension in the air. You see, I, I went to Al-Aqsa Mosque and I actually saw um, a, a big parade of people marching around um, it really just there to intimidate the worshipers, the, the Muslim worshipers who were there. Can you give us some, I think a lot of people don't really fully understand the history of that site and why it's such a contentious area and really why the real reason, the real, real reason why these Israeli soldiers are going after these worshipers in this mosque. And my, my thinking is they ultimately want them to stop going. They ultimately want to make it so difficult to pray in this mosque that they just go somewhere else uh, because you just never know what's going to happen when you're there. So can you explain that history a little bit? Well, let's start by the real reason. The, the real reason is the occupation. Jerusalem, I was born in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, was occupied in 1967. And so there is no reason for the Israelis to be there to begin with. And historically, uh, Al-Aqsa has been, uh, you know, a place for worship for uh, Muslims uh, for more than a thousand years. Uh, recent photos that we've seen, you know, by extremist Israelis, they have been posting pictures of Al-Aqsa. I mean, sorry, pic pictures of the Wailing Wall. And usually the, the Wailing Wall behind it is Al-Aqsa. But And then they, they had the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock disappear from those pictures. So we know the intent. The intent for these extremists is really to destroy Al-Aqsa and rebuild the, the temple in its place. And that's, that's well known. This is uh, uh, one of those leaders is uh, Bezalel Smotrich. He's the uh, current Israel's finance minister who recently... Uh, went to France and displayed a map of Israel that uh, included entire Palestine from uh, the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. But not only this, he included also Jordan, the country of Jordan, parts of Syria and Lebanon. That's part of greater, greater Israel. So we can talk a lot about this. But listen, in the past 18 months to two years, major human rights organizations, international human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch, the United Nations, Amnesty International, Israel's own human rights organi organization, Beth Salem, and, 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 um, and others, they all have labeled Israel as an apartheid state. So, so we know what's going on. When you could go to Jerusalem, most Palestinians cannot use the roads that Israelis, Jewish Israelis use to go to their settlements that are built on Palestinian land. Now, this is a violation of the Four Geneva Convention. Transfer of population, whether in or out of an occupied territory, is a violation of the Four Geneva Convention. Yet the media here says it is disputed, as if nothing happened in 1967, and then there were no populations transferred there. So when Palestinians live on a daily basis 
uh, like this, watching, you know, privileged Jewish Israelis uh, taking over day in, day out their, their properties. Uh, they're prevented from traveling on, on major highways. They have to stand in line for hours to go through checkpoints. What do you describe this as? We describe it as apartheid. Yeah, and I want people to really fully understand this because I've heard all of these things and then I didn't understand it until I went for myself. Uh, it sounds almost like made up that there's these different roads, but it's true. There are certain roads that that are in the West Bank, in what should be the Palestinians' land, and you're not allowed to drive on those roads if you're not an Israeli. You have to be an Israeli. Your car has to have the Israeli license plate. You yourself have to be carrying paper. Everyone in Israel carries papers. Everyone in Israel and throughout uh, Palestine, Jerusalem, everybody has to carry papers. And I would love for you to explain that. But if you're not carrying the correct paper, because they have all these different types of papers, if you're not carrying the correct paper and you're on that road, you're in big trouble. If you're in the wrong car and you're on that road, you're in big trouble. And these are roads that are, I mean, and, and then you're driving on the side or side road next to that road. And that road is for the Palestinians. And you can like just see, you know, the nice, beautiful road. And it's a beautiful, they, you know, they build nice road with nice walls for the Israeli drivers, and then the Palestinians are on, on these uh, roads on the other side. It's unbelie It's unbelievable when you. See, it, it's unbelievable that a society that is claiming to be uh, a forward Western democratic style society, such as Israel, do this to a group of people. But can you explain the papers so that people understand the di the the different sorts of citizenship that you have in Israel and Palestine and Jerusalem, and how it affects the travel? Right. Uh, well, I did a documentary about this in 2015 called uh, Occupied Minds, and I witnessed as they were building that wall. But what happened since the 1967 occupation of the West Bank and Gaza? Israel has created a multi-tier system for Palestinians. And people have to understand now, if we look at Palestine, we call historic Palestine, which is the land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Today, I believe that Palestinians are the majority. If, if they are not the majority, they're at par with the Jewish Israeli population, despite all, all of the immigration and, and transfers and so forth. And why is this? You have, I'll start with the lowest, according to the Israelis, how they kind of put that tier system, are the residents of Gaza. They live, uh, you have close to uh, 2 million or 2.2 probably million Palestinians living in the largest open air prison. They cannot travel by land, they cannot travel by sea. Many of them have to wait months, if not years, for a permit to travel, or they have to use a tunnel to cross into, into Egypt, an illegally constructed tunnel to cross into Egypt. And so that's one tier. They, they cannot do anything, really. They cannot do anything. I mean, in certain humanitarian cases, someone who's suffering from cancer might have to wait six, seven, eight months to get a permit to go to a hospital in Jerusalem, a Palestinian hospital like Al Maqasid Hospital. Then you have the Palestinians who are living in the West Bank. And then you have, actually, those are currently under two tiers because you have you know, different areas, area A and C and so forth. There are the ones who live uh, under the Palestinian Authority since Oslo, and they carry a Palestinian identity card, a Palestinian passport. They cannot cross into Jerusalem. They have to get a certain permit to go there. And then you have also others who live basically in towns and villages. Half of their land uh, uh, has been taken over by settlers, and that's un they are under under Israeli control, but they are also neither Palestinian nor, you know, legally speaking, nor Israeli. They have a different kind of tier. And then you have the residents of Jerusalem. I was born in Jerusalem. We have a Jerusalem ID, which grants us residency, but the residency that the Israeli government can deny you at any time. For, for the craziest reasons, like if you lived outside the country for more than two, three years, they can deny you the residency. If you marry someone from the West Bank, they, you can't bring your spouse in or they will deny you your residency. And then you have Palestinians who are holders of Israeli passports. And we refer to them as 1948, 1948 Palestinians. So you have all these different tiers 
under the law, they they have different functionality. And, and of course, Palestinians under Israeli occupation, they are under military governing laws, unlike Palestinians who are in 1948 with Israeli passports or, or even settlers, Jewish settlers who are living on Palestinian land, they fall under civil Israeli law. So it's a it's kind of hard to wrap your head around it. And I'm yeah. not going to get into all the refugees who have been pushed out and they are now living in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon and elsewhere. It is. It, it's the most bizarre thing. And just to sort of paint this picture a little bit more for those watching who, who can't really quite wrap their minds around it. Um, this these different tiers mean you can travel to certain areas. So I met people who were Jerusalemites. They were born in, in Jerusalem. Their families were in Jerusalem. They married a person from Bethlehem. And right. you, they then have to make a decision. The, if, if you fall in love with someone who's from Bethlehem, that person from Bethlehem, which is only how many minutes away is Bethlehem from Jerusalem? It's not far, right? Do you, Jamal, without do you know a how, checkpoint, Without a checkpoint, it should take you about 15 to 20 minutes. 15, 20 less. minutes, right, from, from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. So you fall in love with somebody from Bethlehem. They are not, the Israelis will not allow that person from Bethlehem to gain Jerusalemite uh, identification and move to Jerusalem. They don't, they're trying to get Palestinians out, not allow any of them back in. So the person from Jerusalem has to choose it, love or stay in Jerusalem in their city 15 minutes away. They choose love. They're going to have to leave Jerusalem because their spouse cannot come live with them in Jerusalem. When, and I saw this happen to so many people when I was there. When you leave Jerusalem, here's where it gets really messed up. You leave Jerusalem, you go marry your spouse, you go live in Bethlehem. You lose your identification to go to Jerusalem. Your parents Correct. live in Jerusalem. You cannot visit your own parents 15 minutes away. Your, your parent has a problem. They need to uh, go to the doctor. It's a holiday. You're not allowed to visit your parents uh, unless you get special, uh, special permission from the Israeli government to allow you that pass into Jerusalem to visit your family. I knew an American, an American Palestinian. Now, Americans are supposed to be able to travel anywhere and everything, everywhere throughout the whole region. But if you're an American Palestinian and they find out that you're actually there to build, the, to build up Palestinians in some way. So I knew an American there who owned a business and who came back to Palestine, born and raised in the United States, totally a Californian American. Uh, went over there to help run the family business. Three years was able to kind of go under the radar, go visit Tel Aviv, go hang out anywhere they and, and fly out of the Tel Aviv airport. But then the Israeli government figured out that that American was actually there to run a Palestinian business and to build up Palestine and revoked, gave put a special thing in their passport, in their American passport that said, you're For now a West years. banker. Yeah, you're now a West banker and you don't even get the right to go to Jerusalem so he was asking me if I could bring things to his grandmother in Jerusalem, which is only a few, not even, not very far away, because an American was being told, you're not allowed to travel around because you're actually a Palestinian and we want you to go away. And that's, that, it's the most bizarre thing that this different tier and different papers and which, where you're allowed to go and where you're not allowed to go. 15 minutes, you're not allowed to go to that, that neighboring place. Because um, I'm wanting to paint this picture as to why the Palestinians are, why there's so much tension, why there's these rockets that ultimately fly into Israel. Tell us about the water situation in Palestine at this point. I know that the people were, they're not getting running water every day. Well, no, no. If you go to Ramallah, and I'm sure if you went to Ramallah in Bethlehem yeah. and you saw all the buildings there, they all have water tanks. I mean, this is something, I don't know if you, you noticed that. They yes, have, of course black plastic large water tanks you don't see this in in settlements you don't see this in tel aviv you don't see this anywhere else except in the west bank and and the question is why and that's because palestinians get their own water from artesian wells on their land only sometimes once or twice a week. So they have to will to fill their water tanks to last them for the entire week while Israeli uh, settlers, they have, you know, just like right here in the United States, uh, water on, on demand. And these, and of course, water is, is, is very rare. I mean, you know, especially now with global warming and things like this, and uh, it's very important. Israel not only does, does this, but they also, 
siphon the water from beneath the farmland where Palestinians actually live. And uh, so, so, so the water situation, uh, uh, I, oh, and I have to mention one other thing. The funny thing about it is not only they steal the water, but they have Israel's uh, water company sells the water back to the Palestinians. You know, right. So, right. not only they don't get enough of it, but they sell it back. Now you can go to the settlements and you can see the settlers, they have swimming pools, they have green lawns like, like here with sprinkler systems. And the Palestinians, they live off the water. And I mean by this, they, this is an agriculture, agrarian society where they have, you know, olive trees, they have, you know, their livelihood. And that's why, you know, the attachment of Palestinians to the olive trees, when settlers go and destroy, the first thing they, they do to Palestinians is they go and destroy their olive trees. So, you know, it's all connected with this, uh, you know, oppression and, and, and really a full-fledged apartheid system. Yeah, and I want people to really understand, when I was there, it, it was really obvious that ultimately the goal is to push Palestinians out. The ultimate goal is to make life so miserable, so difficult. You've got to go through checkpoints if you want to go to school, if you want to go to work, and that if they close down that checkpoint that day and you got to go to a different checkpoint, now you're late and... You know, they may, the people in Palestine have to, you know, here in Los Angeles, we have to always allot for an extra 45 minutes to get somewhere. But in Palestine, they have to allot an extra couple of hours just to get to school in the morning or just to get to work in the morning because of it's unknown which checkpoint is going to be there available or not. Um, but it was really obvious to me that the goal is to get the Palestinians to say, this is too hard. I'm just going to go live in Jordan, or this is too hard. I'm going to immigrate somewhere else because it is a very difficult life. And it seems to me that, you know, what's going on in Al-Aqsa, what seems, this seems to happen every year, this attack on the worshipers at Al-Aqsa during Ramadan. Is this a, is this a yearly thing that seems to happen or how often is this happening? It is a yearly thing. I mean, you don't have to wait for Ramadan. Uh, it happens almost every single Friday, uh, and as I've mentioned, uh, Palestinians go to Al-Aqsa, that's their major mosque to pray every single Friday. You can go and see young Palestinians praying in the streets outside the old city because they are prevented. And as I've mentioned, if you're under the age of 40, the Israelis check your ID and they won't let you in. They decide, you know, they decide who can go in and who cannot, uh, you know, you go in, and so people just pray right, right there in, in the streets. And I wanted to comment on something also you've mentioned about, which the story you've mentioned about the, your Palestinian-American uh, friend. This is, of course, sadly, it's, it's too common, but also uh, Palestinian-Americans get harassed when they travel, right? They travel through yeah. Ben-Gurion Airport. Many of them are not let in, even though they were born in Palestine, like in Jerusalem and other places. And now Israel... And the United States are working on a visa waiver program. I think this is very important for people to know that what Israel now is wants is to have its own citizens travel to the United States without a visa, just like the Europeans, just like citizens from, from France and, 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 and Germany and so forth. And the decision is, is coming into fruition this, this September. And part of the conditions that have been put on Israel is to make sure that they don't discriminate discriminate against uh, Americans, but they do, and they still do that. You know, they just yeah. basically profile you at the airport, and they de decide whether they want to let you in or they don't want to let you in. But at the same time, they receive three point eight billion dollars from the United States, and they want the United States to allow all the, all their citizens, Jewish citizens, to enter this country without a visa. Yeah. It's definitely, um, it's, it's a bizarre, bizarre situation going over there. It, it's not, you know, look, if you just go to Israel and that's the only thing you're going to go do and you're going to go uh, do all the touristy stuff, you're not going to really run into this as much. You know, people say to me, oh, I've been there. I didn't see anything. Everything was fine. And it's like, well, it's because you were going to the tourist areas. But try going into the West Bank, um, not as a tourist, but with a Palestinian guide and, and look at the circus. Uh, when we had tour guides one tour, you know, our main tour guide couldn't go into 
uh, our main bus driver couldn't go into Jerusalem, so we had to get a different driver that day who had who was a Jerusalemite who could actually drive us into Jerusalem that day because the other one couldn't. Same thing when we went to Tel Aviv. You know, it's like it's this circus. Same thing with our translator. It was like we had to get a different translator who could go here, and you know, it's just a circus uh, when you see it all happen. And really, just uh, just wanting to paint the picture of why there's so much tension, why Palestinians are feeling. Um, you know, they're being beaten in their mosques. They're being limited in their daily lives. And so, yes, there's going to be a lot of anger. There's going to be a lot of animosity. And so uh, we are going to see some uh, retaliations that happen, violence that happens. Uh, but rather than just painting a group of people as just a bunch of terrorists, having an understanding that these people are being terrorized quite literally in their own, in their, in their own homes. So, uh, Jamal, Thank you for being here and giving us this other perspective on this, other than what mainstream is always talking about in the news. Where can people find you? Uh, we, we have a weekly show, ArabTalkRadio.com. Uh, we stream it. We also broadcast on the air on KPO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. And your documentary, I want people to watch this. What I, I would like to watch it, in fact. What's the uh, documentary? Occupied Minds, if you Google it now, it's available uh, for free, it's Occupied Minds. It's, so it's available online uh, on, dif on different platforms. I'm actually working on, on a new one uh, shortly. <laughs> we'll be working uh, on that. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me on. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, we are experiencing out of control inflation and who knows what's happening to your retirement accounts, which is why it's a good idea to diversify into other things. One of those other things could be gold because gold is so stable. It has been so stable throughout times of inflation, times of geopolitical instability like we're in right now. We're in all of that right now. Uh, we've also got, you know, strange things happening with our currency, maybe the digital dollar that's coming and you know, all these things. So gold is a great idea at the moment potentially for you. Uh, if you go to birchgold.com slash Kim, you'll get a free info kit and you can also then talk with a specialist who can walk you through the best way to get you into some gold or into gold even more, if you already have some, you can convert p potentially your 401k or IRA into an IRA in precious metals. You could potentially get physical gold and silver that you want to keep at your house uh, in a safe or something. There's a lot of different ways that you can get yourself diversified into the type of currency that seems to be the most stable. And also we know that potentially the next world global currency that's rising or even the competing one is going to be backed by gold. So gold is a great thing to be thinking about. Go to birchgold.com Kim to get that free info kit on gold.